So welcome, folks, to uh, our next presentation. Uh, you can see on the, the banner over here that uh, one of the mantras for EDGE is God is up to something. And there is a narrative about what's going on in the world right now uh, that tends to be often very negative. And it's really important uh, what narratives we privilege. Uh, Barbara Brown Taylor talks about that. Uh, some narratives inspire fear and the closing of the heart and division of people and other narratives about what's happening inspire courage and hope and connection and so it's important that we tell the stories of what God is up to and uh, there are some amazing things that are happening both within and beyond the church and one of those stories uh, happens to be centered at Hillhurst United and we've got John Pentland here to talk a little bit out of his experience of that ministry but I'll just share one story. Uh, the, when I went to worship at um, Hillhurst for the first time, and before I even got in the door, I could just feel the energy and the joy that was radiating uh, from that uh, gathering before the service. And uh, I couldn't find John. Actually, John and I went to school together. We've been friends for about 25 years. and. Um, I couldn't find John until about 40 minutes into the service, but I do remember, I do remember a young teen. It, it started off with a, a YouTube video of a guy in the U.S. Army when it was "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" coming up to his father while he's on duty in Iraq. The text was 1 Corinthians 13, "Love is," and he asked his dad, "Do you love me?" And then, "Do you still love me?" And then there was a teen that talked about. Uh, what it means to walk with a friend through bullying in high school. And then there was a young guy who had only been in the congregation for three weeks, talked about what it means to move away from a home, a faith community, a country, and come and find a home waiting for them. And I don't remember anything that John said when he showed up <laughs> later in the service. <laughs> but you're going to remember what he has to say today. Please help me in welcoming him. Thank you, Rob. Um, I want to begin by thanking Edge. Uh, I've been around for the last two hours and you've heard some of the great things that Edge is doing in the United Church. When I think of what's, what's really keeping us going and what's pushing us in new directions is the innovation of Edge and the permission the United Church of Canada has given that group to, to be set free to do amazing things. And we've heard so many things already today about how that's happening and I give thanks for the leadership of the church that's smart enough to say, let's not get Let's not get in their way. Let's see what the Spirit will do. And I think Edge is a fine example of that. I'm not really going to talk about Hellhurst United Church um, yet. Uh, I will talk about it a bit with Danielle, who's my colleague who's here. Um, 
and, and the book, Fishing Tips, we can talk a bit about that in a while. What I want to share with you a bit now is, uh, is sort of the next thing I'm thinking about, uh, which will come out in about two years, actually, I hope, if I, if I get to this. Um, I think we're living in a really exciting time, and clearly this, uh, this festival is an example of that. Uh, people who are checking out varieties of things that are happening in new and creative ways. And I think the church, uh, if, we, if we're smart enough, will catch up with this, what the Spirit is doing. And, and we'll tag along with where the Spirit's leading. Because God and the Spirit are way bigger than any denomination, any church, anywhere. And if we're wise enough to pay attention to where the Spirit is pushing or leading or calling, we'll be in fine shape. But I really, truly, truly believe we're living in an exceptional oper time of opportunity because spirituality is very popular in the world. Uh, it's often beyond the church uh, that we'll hear lots about what's going on in the world um, in coffee shops where you hear people talking about their relationships, their work, their kids, uh, the presidential election. Uh, all kinds of topics are talked about in coffee shops. And the, there's a sense in which you can say, I'm spiritual, and people will not run the other way. Uh, if you say you're religious, they will whistle and sneak away from you, right? But if you say you're spiritual, generally people will nod and say, yeah, I'm a spiritual person. They'll talk about the things they do. Um, I want to read to you, and I, it's a little bit of a quiz, and I'll give you a free book afterwards if you can guess this. I was looking at the book of context, uh, of context in a book, and this was the titles of some of the things that were going to be discussed in this book, and I want you to tell me which book it is. Uh, the first was the context were love, confidence, hope, courage, Truth, balance, love story, and seeing in a new way. What book is that? Bible. No, not the Bible. That, but that's five for five. That's the answer. Whenever I say that, the first thing I say is Bible. What's the book? It's got these titles in it. Truth, balance, love story, seeing in a new way, balance, confidence. Truth, balance, love story. Keep going. No. No. It could be Fifty Shades of Grey, but no. You know what book that is? It's the book Onward. And that is the story of Starbucks. So listen to what they're talking about in Starbucks. These are the titles of the, of the chapters. Love, confidence, hope, and courage. Truth, balance, love story, and seeing in a new way. So it's interesting to see how a coffee shop and a coffee business is using the language that we would talk about in a spiritual context as the way in which they're going to run their business. And so we're seeing already, I think, in our culture, ways in which people are very comfortable talking about the kinds of things you would expect we talk about in church, uh, but perhaps we don't. And spirituality is very, uh, it's, a, it's a conversation people are welcome to engage in and very confident about. Right now you can find books on uh, the spirituality of wine, of sex, of grandparenting, of gardening, right? All kinds of ways in which spirituality is an open, uh, free market conversation about how we connect. When I think about uh, spirituality, I define it this way. It is seeing the sacred connections in all of life. And we know from our understanding theologically that the word spirit has a breath or wind, and it's what keeps us alive. It is a, it's a movement, it's energy, it's what's life-giving. We'll talk about teams that have good team spirit. Spirituality is in a conversation, and the church perhaps is in it, perhaps not. But the most important thing is, I would want to say, is that spirituality is providing an opportunity for the church to connect. For the church to connect with what's already going on in the world. And so you might say to yourself, so what are some of the things that you would associate with spirituality? You might say, uh, hiking, or yoga, or walking, or gardening, or baking, or music, or meditation. There's a whole variety of ways we would say, these are the things that feed my soul. They are good for me. They are the way that I connect. Whether or not we're in a church or not, those are the ways in which spirituality is talking about. I have an example of this in a story that I want to share with you, and then I'm going to ask you to think about this, because I'm going to talk, and then I'm going to be talking to each other, because you don't want to listen to somebody talk for, for, for very long. I was, uh, it went into the, into the uh, Apple store, and I was getting my iPad fixed, and the guy who was with me says, uh, it was a son of a woman in our church, and he, he helped me work on it, and then he said, as I was about to leave the story, he said, I'll see you Christmas Eve. And I said, what do you mean Christmas Eve? He said, well, that's when my mother makes me go to church. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay. And I, then I was, kept stopped and said, well, if I had a sermon that you would want to hear, what would it be about? And he drew a blank. So then I said to him, look, you got three days. Text me with the topic I promise I'll preach on. 
So literally the third day, the last minute, I got this text and it said, how to ride a bike. How to ride a bike. And I thought, so is this really what he wants me to think about? First I thought it was garbage. And I started thinking about it. Okay, what, what, what is the spirituality of how do you ride a bike? And so uh, I began to think about it. And I began to think about when you're riding a bike, I'm a, I'm a road uh, biker, you need to breathe into the hills. Anybody who tries to go up a hill holding their breath will not do it. You have to breathe into the hills. And I was thinking about the spirituality of that, the breath and wind, the spirituality. When we're trying to get up through tough stuff, we have to breathe. We have to remember to breathe and to draw that in. The second thing I thought about is the importance in the spiritual journey of paying attention. And cyclists will know that you have to really pay attention to what's on the road, what's in front of you, what's going on all around you, or things can go wrong. And I was driving home on my bike, and when you're riding, you're, you look about 10 feet in front of you, uh, I do anyway, uh, and I, I was going along this sidewalk, and I suddenly found myself literally in this deep of wet cement. I literally <laughs> fell in, fell over, I can remember looking up, and all I could see was this guy standing who just made this beautiful driver <laughs> leaning on his rake, staring at me. He just shook his head. He just shook his head. He didn't say one word. I said, I'm so sorry. There was no sign. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't. I kept doing all these excuses. He just stood there and stared at me, right? Uh, and I wish I had 20 bucks because I would have given it to him. I know at the end of the day he was going to go to everybody and say, you wouldn't believe the idiot I saw today, right? Because I wasn't paying attention. But in, in the spiritual journey, it's all about paying attention. In a spiritual journey, you will learn and you will discover that paying attention is where we discover God most fully. The other thing we learned from that particular story is how often in a spiritual journey we have to learn to say, I'm sorry. And so often that's the hardest words we have in this, and to, to say to someone when we've gone wrong is, I'm sorry. And the fourth thing that I've learned about cycling and the connection to spiritual journey is we've got to enjoy the ride. And I heard some of the speakers say today, you know, when you're coming up with a good idea in your church, don't go, if people say no, don't worry about them. Go with the people who say yes. And so often in the spiritual journey, we have to have a sense in which there's joy and playfulness. Stop doing things and start doing things. So for me, when I think about the spiritual journey, well, the first thing I think about is cycling. That's where I'm, where I'm paying attention, where new ideas coming, where I'm, where I'm really focusing in, and, and I kind of unwind. So my question for you or the people right near you is, what is the one thing that you do that you would call a spiritual activity? Is it music, or pottery, or bakery? You're only gonna get two minutes, but you gotta meet the people around you and say, for me, I would say cycling and say something. What would you say with the people near you? Please, it's three minutes, it's all I'm gonna give you, because there's no point listening to me. What about it with the person? What do you do? You got three minutes, please go. Make sure you say why you do it. Okay, 30 seconds more, something that you do that's spiritual and why. Okay, so, so we are quite comfortable, I think, in our world. Generally, you could say, I'm a spiritual person. People will come along with you. They'll listen to the conversation. They will not run away. If you say to them, you're a religious person, chances are they will stop, smile, and sneak away. Because there's something about the word religion, there's something about religion that's got a bad rap. It's clear in our culture right now, when you say you're religious, there's people that will look at you, think you're dumb, uh, think you're naive, think you're judgmental, think you're not a very nice person. Because the way religion is talked about in our culture right now, it has a bad rap. It gets loaded with things like doctrine and dogma, people with being, who are closed minds, people who are judgmental. 
And it's really tragic because um, we do know, and lots of us will say, I'm religious, but. That is, I'm religious, but I'm not like that. And yet, bad religion is part of what we're seeing all the time. But I love the etymology of the word religion. Do you know what it is? It, is, it has this root, religion is ligure, uh, ligament. And so the word religion means to bind together. And, and not bind together like choke you, but bound together around symbols, stories, and songs, the things that are valuable to us. And so religion is at its root is a really beautiful word. We are bound together. And I would say this event's an example. We're bound together over a common interest, a common central focus in our spiritual and religious life. The other thing I think we have to remember is religion's done some great things. Yes, we know there are people out there who are burning Korans or are making uh, horrific statements about the LGBT community. However, religion historically has done great things like start universities, like get health care happening in Canada, Tommy Douglas, or Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement was clearly a religious experience. We would say that the truth and reconciliation work in Canada itself has that religious root. And so there's lots of good things that religion has done. We just don't get the good press about it. There's lots of things that happen in churches, and I'm discovering, you heard perhaps some of this today, that churches are doing some great things, both in program, programs or when they gather as people on a community. So my question for you now, for the next question is, what's an aspect of your religious community that you're in that does something that you really value? As an example, it might be you really value a sermon, or you might value coffee time, or you might really value a particular program or a study. When you think of the church, if you have a church you're a part of, what's one thing your religious community that binds you together, what's one thing it does that you really value? Please talk to the people near you. You have three minutes. One thing, hopefully, that your church does well. One thing your church does well. Okay, we're, we're, how many people here were able to put up their hand to say that your community does something that you value? Awesome. Um, it's so important when you come to these events, you don't realize that we don't often tell other people about the good things that we do. And it's so important to get a sense of what is it that we do do well. I would make the case that Jesus was uh, a, a, both a spiritual and a religious person. That is, he spent time away from the temple, but as you heard last night uh, from Jamie, you know that Jesus um, was involved in the temple, as was his custom, you heard last night. And I envisioned Jesus going back and forth, in and out of the religious community, the gathering of the people that were bound together in the Jewish religion, and out. He spent a lot of time out on the edges. Richard Rohr would say he spent his t time on the outer, e inside edge of the outer circle. But he was always out there. Uh, and, and you don't get crucified if you're hanging around with everybody in the temple. You usually get in trouble when you're out on the edges with people who are pushed aside, the least, the lost, and the lonely. And that's where Jesus spent his time. But he did both the religious and spiritual journey. And he did that very well. And I believe we should honor and invite us to consider both the spiritual and the religious. I was at an event uh, in the spring uh, with Lillian Daniels at Vancouver School of Theology. She wrote a book called um, When Spiritual is Not Enough. And she talks, makes a, a sort of a, a case for religion. And she reminds, uh, reminded us of these three kinds of people 
that are that we that are that are in our culture right now. The first group are the no ways. Those are people who look at religion and they're saying, no way will I ever be involved in that kind of community. And the no ways are the people who have been hurt by religion, who've been pushed out by religion, who have been blamed or judged by religion. Um, and the no ways just don't want anything to do with it. The second group she talked about was the no longers. Those are the people who may drift into a church for a while, they get a kid done, and then they disappear, right? We just move on down the road. Or life gets busy, hockey, soccer, all the things that take us busy, and they're sort of the no longers, but they're around us. And then the final group she talked about was a group called the not yets. And those are the people who don't know much about religion, but might be interested. So she talked about this case for the no ways, no longers, and not yets. And it invites our churches to think about how are we doing in churches for the people who are no ways, the people who, uh, who have assumptions about us. How are we speaking to the people who would, who would think that we are judgmental, that we are narrow, that we do exclude? Our particular church has a banner out front, and this is worthwhile for churches to think about. What would be the banner that you would want to post? Ours is this, whoever you are, wherever you're at, join us on the journey. So it doesn't get much wider than that. Whoever you are, wherever you're at. Now it gets to be a challenge for a church to try to live that, because sometimes people lift it up and say, hold on, the banner says whoever you are, wherever you're at. And how are we going to live that? So for the no ways, we need to think about how will we be inclusive. The second group, the no longers, those are the people that, that know we exist, but they're not quite sure. The best example of this is I can think of a guy in our church, and he, he's often got his phone in his hand, he's often on the phone a lot. And this is a true story. He was walking down the street, and this particular Sunday, a week, I put up this sign in front of the church. It, it was a blackboard sign with chalk. I just written, we don't do guilt. And literally, he was walking down the street, and he bumped into it. And he reads this, we don't do guilt. He walks home and he tells his wife, who is a former Catholic. And she goes, what do you mean? Churches, that's what their expertise is guilt, right? <laughs> and so they came to our church that Sunday. And they came and they came and they came. He's now the chair of our board. But here's a person who bumped in literally to the sign, we don't do guilt. And that no longer became the chair of our board. The final group, the not yet. Those are the people you heard some people speak about last night and today. Those are the people that sneak into our churches and they might come in in the back, they sit near the back of the church and they want to check out what's going on, scan to see if there's any secret handshakes or whether everybody talks to everybody but them. I had a Sunday when I was getting ready for Sunday morning and I was at the front moving my papers around. I looked at the back, I saw this woman, she called me over. She said, John, and she clutched her Starbucks. She said, I've never been to a wedding, a funeral, or a baptism. What do I need to know? And I think about her every week, Stephanie. What do I need to know? And so often churches do everything that everybody knows in the church, but not the person like Stephanie. And so we need to think in our churches, how do we, how do, we do what we do and say what we say and live in a way that the person like Stephanie could come in and be part of it and not feel excluded? So in our churches, we need to think about the not yets, the no longers, and the no ways. Because these people are the ones that the United Church in particular, I think we have the best chance at addressing these three groups that Lily invites us to. So I began to think about it after this, and this talk was called the three R's. But really, it's, I've, since then I've got 14. I'm not going to do them all now. But I've been thinking about the word religion, R, and I've been thinking, what if, if we were going to get this right, if we were going to do it, if we were going to try to step in and truly live what really matters, what would we be doing? And so I thought of our words. So the first one is, I think good religion reminds us. Good religion helps us remember who we are. The culture will tell us so many messages about who we are and what's of value and who's of value, but good religion reminds us who we are as beloved children of God. Every Sunday in our church, I didn't know this until people started to tell me this. Every Sunday, when we, after we create a centering prayer, a, a time for silence, we, our words of assurance are essentially every week this. You are loved, you are forgiven, and you are set free. Trust in these words. This mantra has come back to me over and over and over again. Because I don't think we're aware of how many people are told they're not good. They're not forgiven. They're not of value. And church, if it's about anything, needs to be reminding every one of us over and over and over again how good we are in God's eyes. 
There's a friend of mine who says, the only reason I go to church is to be remembered and to remember who he is. And I'll, t I'll tell you, I invite you to test this. Has anybody been to a spin class? That is, spin class is the best church in the world. You, when you go to that and you jump on the bike and you're sitting there, I did this, I sat in the back, I was the youngest by 25 years, sit in the back, they, in that class they'll say, you're awesome, you're amazing, you can do it, we're a team. Do we ever hear that kind of affirmation in church? Not very often. You're amazing. You're awesome. We can do it. We're a team. And so I think good religion, number one, reminds. The second is good religion needs to be reasonable. And when I say that, good religion needs to use our mind. Because so much of what's going on in the world and the culture and those people are speaking on our behalf are not using their mind. And I'm not saying it's all about an intellectual game. I'm saying that the ancient Jewish tradition of the Midrash, of argument and debate, of using our mind and our bodies and our thinking and our faith really, really matters. And religions, good religion, will recover the ancient words. Words like confession. You know the word confession? You know what it means? It means with voice. That's all it means. It doesn't mean guilt. It means to voice something. Or the word salvation. The word salvation has its root salve or healing. And in the prairies we know this. It means in Latin, to develop without hindrance in wide open spaces. So these ancient words have such beautiful and rich heritage, and re good religion recovers what is already there. Good religion is reasonable and is it uses mind, and we, we invite scholars to help us be stretched, whether it's someone like Brene Brown, who's not a theologian but a fantastic sociologist, or Sally McFaig, who is a, an environmentalist at Vancouver School of Theology who invites us to rethink our role in the, in the environment where the earth is God's body, she invites us to know. To imagine the world and, and the planet as God's body. When we look at the theologians like Richard Rohr, uh, Mark and I were there this past year, a fantastic uh, theologian, wisdom theologian, the whole tradition of recovering the ancient wisdom is what Richard Rohr is doing. If you don't do anything after this weekend, but write these letters down, C-A-C, Center for Action and Contemplation. I get his thought for the day, it's three paragraphs. I've told my congregation, if you get the C-A-C, thought for the day, don't bother ever coming to church again, because it is so fantastic. Three paragraphs a day of the wisdom literature, this, he is helping us rethink the role of wisdom in our faith and our experience. So what I'm saying when I say good religion is reasonable is that it uses our mind. It invites us to think with our faith. And this became really apparent to me in uh, 1982. 1982, I was 22 years old. Uh, my brother, who was uh, 27, had just gotten married. He'd been married uh, two months, went in for some heart surgery, and somebody messed up in the surgery, and he died. And that particular time, uh, when you're 22, you know everything. I got a couple of these at home right now. You know everything, and you think you get all figured out, right? But suddenly my world was turned upside down where I had to rethink, okay, I thought if you did live your life right, God would reward you and you would live a long life. And suddenly I had to really think, well, is God in control or not? And strangely, that year is when Harold Kushner came out with the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, a reasonable book that invites us to rethink our theology and our faith and our understanding. That book saved my bacon, saved my life, and kept me in the religious, spiritual journey. And so I would say these thinkers, these people that are coming up, and you'll have your own people in your life, that help us use our mind faithfully is good religion. The third, the third good religion I think is real. This is uh, symbolized in our church uh, with Kleenex, every pew. That is, there's no bullshit. We try to be real, we try to be honest, we invite people to speak uh, from their heart and their mind about what is important to them. We seek to invite people to not play religion or checkbox religion, just move through the motions, but actually be real in what matters. And how it comes alive at our church is testimonials. We don't call it that. We call it uh, sharing our story. And we invite people to speak. And, and you heard uh, Rob speak of somebody already. I remember when a medical doctor talked about it through her own mental illness, how she lost her license to practice. Or on a Sunday where we had two fathers who who were having their, they just adopted two boys together, how they were speaking about what it was like to be two dads on their first Father's Day together. Or I can think of many people in the community who, who just speak on Mother's Day as an example. What's, what's it like being a new mom and to have somebody come and share some of their story? 
My point in telling you this is good religion is real. It's honest. There's no, no playing around. It's just the way it is. And I saw this most profoundly this past winter. It's, I've been doing this 28 years, the most important baptism I've ever seen. I got a call from this woman in the church. She said, can you come to our house? Uh, we've got a problem. I said, sure. I don't normally do that, but I went to their house. Came in there, and this woman said, here's the gig. We got a four-year-old daughter who wants to be baptized. She said, I grew up in the United Church. My dad's a United Church minister. I love the music. It's a really important thing. The husband, John, says, here's my problem. I don't believe in God. And he said, but I go to your church every week, and literally he does, and I like what's going on here. The four-year-old, I said, so what's baptism for you? She goes, I just can't wait to have the water poured on my head. And I love kid space, which is study school. So I said, I'm totally fine with this baptism as long as you're willing to tell people. So sure, that Sunday came up, and she stood up and said, I love the church, part of my life. He steps up and he says, here's the gig. The God thing doesn't work for me, but I'm here every week, and I love what you people do here. And then he hikes up his four-year-old daughter, and she says, I can't wait to have the water poured on my head. <laughs> but what I'm saying, people, people gave a standing ovation that day before the baptism because it was... He wasn't crossing his fingers, he wasn't lying, he was saying what he thought, she spoke what she thought, and so did the four-year-old. And I think that good religion has to be real, and it has to be willing to have people say, this is who I am, where I'm at. In our church, a third of the people are United Church, a third are Catholic or Evangelical refugees, and the other third are no church. They're just circling around the edges. And that's a rich diversity, and it needs to be real. So good religion is real. Number five. Number five, it has to have good ritual. Good ritual. And you might say sacraments. I'll say ritual. One of our rituals is coffee, or sacraments is coffee. But I've seen so much bad church when I get a chance to wander around that is just going through the motions as though nothing really matters or just getting through to the end. A good example of this in our community just happened one time when we decided... When people weren't quite sure, and it actually came out of a kid space question about where does bread come from? We thought about that. What if maybe we need to make this part of our teaching. And so literally on the Sunday before communion, we set up four stations at the church uh, at the front of tables. And what we give them is dough. And for the prayer time, people are just invited to come forward. And instead of saying their prayers, there's music playing, and they knead their prayers into the bread. And I'll never forget the day, the first day we did this, a woman who had had a stroke, she can barely speak, a senior walks to the front, and I'll never forget her face as she kneads this bread, and she, tears are coming down her cheeks, and she says to me, I remember the farm. But there's something about the connection between we're going to break this bread and the community that happens in that kind of ritual. And I think good religion creates, many good religions create good rituals, whether it's bike blessings or backpack blessings, or um, uh, Sue Browning was telling me about in the rural area, they do seed blessings. These rituals of our culture, if we're able to bring them in to our religious experience, there's so much greater connection between our religious and spiritual life. Number six, I would say good religion is relevant. Carl Barth used to say the Bible in one hand, the newspaper in the other. I would say the Bible in one hand, the iPhone in the other. How are we connecting? What's going on? What are people reading about? What are people talking about? What are people uh, wrestling with in the coffee shops? What are people um, worried about? What are people celebrating? And if you don't know what that is, just go and eavesdrop in a coffee shop. Just sit down and listen to what people are talking about. And then say to yourself, how are we addressing this in our worship experience on a Sunday? I had this come more fully to me one day. I was down the street at a coffee shop, and I came in. I was in line, and the woman in front of me, I'd seen her before. She's one of the women who, you know, when the cars stop at a streetlight, they walk up and they try to get money? Well, she, this, was, this was who she was. And, and I said, can I buy your coffee? And she said, sure. So then she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to work. And I said, she said, where do you work? I said, I work at the church down the road. She goes, oh, I hear good things about your church in this conversation. Then later that week, I'm walking down the street, and I bump into this uh, city councillor. And we start walking down and talking about this, that, and the other thing. As the conversation ended, she said to me, I hear good things about your church. And then on a Sunday, uh, and if you ever come to our church, uh, you can spot a visitor, because they're always dressed up, and we're not. There was this guy who came out, and he had a suit on and a tie, and I knew he was a visitor. And I said, you're new here. He goes, yeah. I said, I hear good things about your church. 
My point in telling you this is if you can have somebody that is um, literally panhandling and somebody's involved in politics and somebody's visiting say, I hear good things about your church, then I think we're on to something. That is, that it's not one particular group, but a variety of groups that will consider and say that you are relevant to what is going on. And so our churches that I would say are having a good religious experience are paying attention to what people are talking about throughout the week. This week when I was up in Muskoka, I went by a United Church and there was a sign out front. And, and this, uh, this week they were looking at The Danish Girl, the movie. And the next week they were looking at The Martian. Now those two movies, some might look at and say, why are you just showing that in a church? But what a better place to talk about those, two, those kinds of issues that are raised in those fantastic movies. So good religion is relevant. The final one I want to say is um, good religion takes seriously resurrection. That is, uh, we, we take seriously that God is going to do something with dry, dead bones. And that God is going to do something and bring forth new life. And I think that um, th this came to me from a woman in our community who was new to the church. She said to me at one point, she said, I finally figured out what it is that church does. She said, you do death well. And what she was saying was this. She said, you, you invite people to talk about the sorrows and suffering and difficulties in life and a hope and promise for something different. And the person that's helped me most fully with this is Richard Rohr, who says that bad religion is this. Bad religion is, is where people hide out in church. And what a perfect place to hide out can be church. And what Rohr says is this, that we need to remind people that people think that people that go to church have all their shit together. <laughs> and we all know that's the biggest lie ever. But we need to be willing to let people know that this is an acceptable place for all people. And he says it this way. He says, we live, uh, we live in disorder, or, or sorry, order. We, our life goes along, order is fine. And then there's disorder. Things fall apart. And then there's reorder. And so his, his, what, he's in, what he invites us in this thinking is to say that there's this natural movement we all go through in our life. And churches that are willing to attention and honor and help people through that experience will thrive because there's honesty. Or he'll talk about it this way. This first half of life where we're building the container for our life, we're getting all of the things we need. At some point or another, everyone in this tent, I'm sure, has had a time when things fall apart, when th somebody dies, when somebody gets ill, or uh, brokenness happens, a divorce happens. And then there is a second half of life that moves us through to the, to the resurrection, to new life, new hope, new promise. And I believe that churches that are able to honor and to name that movement order, disorder, reorder, first half of life, transition, second half of life, are the places that will thrive and attract and draw people to them. I think one of the things the United Church might be at right now is in this disorder. Maybe we just need to say, right now we're just in this place where we're just sorting out what that reordering is going to look like, or what the second half of life of the United Church of Canada is. Individually and corporately, there's that sense to me of this, this movement that we are invited to, and that is about resurrection. And it's also about, I think, most fully known uh, in the contemplative movement we are finding and discovering right now. There's lots of books about the Newman Sutton and monasticism. There's books about inter-spirituality, and that's not just about different world religions, but it's about the practice of these other world religions and the other disciplines of science and sociology, psychology, and business. The marriage of all of these which we're seeing is something new and something that is, is about resurrection and a new life. So those are some of the some some of the um, the R's that I'm thinking about. And there's a there's a whole pile more. But I want to tell you close with this last story because it, it articulates for me how this gets uh, gets lived out. Um, this is when I was in my first uh, charge in just outside of Edmonton. Um, there was a woman I met, her name was Lily, and Lily, uh, Lily was a, a, told me the story about how she met her husband Bill. She lived in the, uh, in the city and Bill came in from the rural area to a farm, this is about 50 years ago, to a dance in the city. And they danced and they got to know each other, eventually the, they, they became married, they moved out to the farm, and when you move out to the farm you want to get in good with your mother-in-law. And so she says, I, I found a way to get in with my mother-in-law. This is what I was going to do. She was part of the UCW at the United Church. And so I would drive her and pick her up. So 
literally. She would drive her mother-in-law to the United Church, drop while she went to the meeting, and then came back, and then went back to pick her up. One night, she got to the church to pick her up. And uh, the, the lights are still on, and the meeting's going on, and she's wondering, what's going on? So she opens the door, and she goes in. And I say, the UCW say, oh, Lily, you're here. We were looking for somebody for our committee. We need you. And she goes, I, I can't, 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 can't do, do this. You see, Lily had been told by her father she was stupid, that she would never amount to anything, and she was useless. And because of that abuse, she stuttered. One of the women wisely at the table said, that's okay. You record, I'll read. In the United Church, you know, you're never off the hook, huh? <laughs> So sure enough, she sits down, and every meeting she records and hands it off to the reader, and they read it out. So the, so the meeting came when that person who was going to report it back didn't. And the women at the table said to Lily, said, Lily, you read. And so she began to read and read. And month after month after month, she read until her stutter completely disappeared. And it was the support of those women and the, and the compassion and caring that actually healed her. Now, the, it gets even better than this. Then when she's an adult, she says, I want to go, I want to get a university degree. So she goes to Athabatica University, gets a degree. Then she decides she wants to be a minister. So then she goes to the Divinity School in Saskatoon for four years, and she gets her MDiv. And here's the most amazing, crazy thing the United Church did. They settled her back in the very same place where these women had healed her and helped her become a whole person. And if you think of that story and this person, the, the, the good religion I'm talking about, it is that kind of place that is, that is real, that is relevant, that speaks about resurrection, and actually lives it. And so for me, the things that are interesting to me are the opportunities that churches have to marry uh, spirituality and religion, and with confidence and courage, promote and provoke and invite that. And so I want to say to you, thank you for listening to some of this wanderings of mine. And I want to invite Danielle to come forward, who's with us. Um, Danielle came on staff this year uh, at our church, and we wanted to share something about specific about the church. I want to say thank you. Those are the seven R's. I've got 14. Uh, I'll chisel it down to probably back down to three key ones. But but I want you to take one moment, if you would will, to the people right near you. What's the one R, and what's what's the one R you think is the most important, either the ones I've said or another, about what's good religion when it's happening? What's happening? You just talk to the persons near you when it's good. What is good religion? And I'd like to hear them because I'll steal them. Okay, I want to hear some of those. What are some of the good religions? What words would you use? Real? Meaningful? Regenerative. Regenerative. Okay, I'll steal that one. That's a good one. Yeah. Relevant. Relevant. Yeah. Rejuvenate. Rejuvenate. Yeah. Relationships. Relationships. That's all relationality. It's a good one, too. That's in the 14. Yeah. Resurrection. Okay, here's my hope on that uh, reflection that we, that we shared together a bit, is to think about when good religion's happening, what's happening. And churches, I think, that are thriving are, are paying attention to what that good religion is and seeking to make that happen. So thank you for sharing that conversation with me. Okay, Danielle. Tent. Hi. So I'm Danielle Ianna James. I've been in ministry for ordained now for 12 years. And uh, with John Pentland's serve and team ministry at Hillhurst United Church, I've been there for a year. It's my 12th month anniversary um, this month, July. So it's good to be with you all and good to be in the Edge tent. Edge is my tribe. Edge, yeah. Edge is our peoples. These are peoples, a network of individuals who care about the United Church, who care about God's church universally, 
um, and who are striving to put their feet to the ground using their voice, their hands, their feet, their entrepreneurship, their social innovation, innovation and enterprise to make things happen in our neighborhoods and beyond. So um, to Rob and the team, thank you for all that you are and all that you do. It makes a difference. Um, John, I thought that we would sort of just tag team a little bit here. Um, we get the sense that some of you have heard about Hillhurst. Anybody heard about Hillhurst in Calgary, Kensington? Um, so we thought that we might just talk a little bit about um, our experience there. John has a fabulous book. Let me give him a plug. It's called Fishing Tips, and there's a copy somewhere that I can lift up and show you. There's a bunch in the Agriplex, too. Okay, there's a bunch in the Agriplex. And for me, this was the historical document when I came in last July to give me the history of this place. Our archives, room is in shambles. But this, was the, this is the book that tells the story of the past decade of John's ministry there at Hillhurst and um, the top nine things that really helped to uh, revitalize and revision that community. Um, a few things for me when I came in, there was a, it was interesting joining a, t a team and a congregation that already had quite an established brand and identity. And some of you might be here where you know what it is to step into a community um, and you might be in the shadow of another minister. You might be experiencing some of the inherited stories, biases, assumptions, conflicts of place the, the place before. Um, when I came into Hillhurst, there was a real sense that this congregation was living into the banner on the front, which says, whoever you are, wherever you're at, join us on the journey. It makes a difference when a community tries to walk their talk. Amen? Um, when a community tries to put their feet to the ground and live into uh, the identity, the vision, mission statement that they have placard on their wall. This is a church that's been around for, we estimate, somewhere between 103 and 105 years. We always change it up, depending on the Sunday. Um, about, about 100 years old. Um, and so the pews reflect that. Um, and 100, over 100 years ago, there was a newspaper clipping that said, Hillers United Church open to the community seven days a week, striving to be a seven days a week church. And this community definitely tries to do that. Um, seven days a week, there's something happening. Um, established ministries, like our Affirm ministry, um, which has been up and happening for the past seven years, led by the fabulous Pam Rocker, um, a dedicated um, leader who is there 30 hours a week leading and living into our reconciling ministry um, with LGBTQ individuals and families. Um, this is a community seven days a week that uh, John, 10 years ago, started just what you might call a renewed kind of Bible study. We call it spiritual nurture. It happens on Monday nights every Monday night, minimum once a week. There's programming happening that lasts two hours. Someone is presenting, someone is engaging, someone is asking progressive, leaning questions about identity and what it is to be fully human and fully alive every week. And it can be anywhere from 15 people to 75 people showing up curious who might see the invitation outside on the street or who get our weekly Hillhurst happenings in the news. In the year that I've been there, um, probably just to say three things about what's been new in the time we've been there. We've started um, something called Thrive, and it's a millennial ministry. And so for those who self-identify and say that they're between the ages of 25, 35 or so, um, what's been really interesting about this group, and, and they've been a primary group I've been working with, is the dedication and the commitment that they've put into it. I say that because when we had our first gathering at a local coffee shop in December last, um, I asked them, so what are you most afraid of? We're afraid of dedication and commitment. We're millennials. We want to text you half an hour before and say, well, we might be there. <laughs> and I said, okay, hold on. This has to be a little bit different. And these folks, this core team of five leaders, stepped into the arena. They leaned in, like um, Sandberg says, and they've committed week after week, every Thursday between 7 and 9, they gather. And this community, the last time we gathered at the local um the local pub for uh, souls and spirits um, last Thursday, there was something like 25, 27 of them gathered. And every week it just continues to grow, continues to snowball. The other ministry um, that was really interesting in my one year there has been our refugee ministry. And that's been super great because like so many of you, that, that um, September 3rd day, you remember that picture of the little boy that um, washed up dead on the shore and all of Canada was moved and we knew we need, needed to be mobilized. And Hillhurst Congregation um, opened their doors um, uh, three days later for an interspiritual and interfaith 
um, vigil um, where we began to mobilize uh, the community, including our mayor, um, to do something soon and immediately. And a refugee ministry was born, and the congregation, um, the congregation and the community in less than two months raised $75,000 in order to sponsor a family. Now, out of that $75,000, about eight or 9,000 of it, that's all, was from members of Hillhurst United Church. That's it. The rest of it was from the greater community, just by telling our story through social media, through Twitter, through Facebook, through connections in the community. They wanted to make sure that the neighborhood of Calgary knew that Hillhurst United Church was up to something. They wanted to make it vocal, they wanted to make it tangible, they wanted to make it real. So from the pulpit on the Sunday after this happened, um, uh, John, I'm not sure if it was really offering or what time of the service, kind of said to the church, you know what, we really should be walking in solidarity with refugees around the world. And somebody after the service says, well, you know what, we should be walking in solidarity. So four weeks later on Thanksgiving Monday, Thanksgiving Monday, when everybody else was probably having their turkey and their mashed potatoes, a hundred people from the city of Calgary, about one third of them from Hillhurst, two thirds from the neighborhoods of Calgary, met at the Calgary Peace Bridge, 10 o'clock on Thanksgiving Monday. And we walked, some of us walked three kilometers, some walked five and some walked 10 raised $6,000 on that Thanksgiving Monday to go toward the welcoming of a family. And they did arrive. The Yastin family, Adnan, the father and mother, Mona, arrived on February 8th of this year with their five daughters, seven of them. And uh, we're now in the midst of working to get their two elder sons who are still in Syria and need a separate application because they had to apply as Syrian males. So just a few snapshots about some of the things that are happening at Hillhurst. Some of you may have some curiosity, A, about the book, A, about stories that you've heard, rumors that you've heard that we can verify or debunk for you. Thought that we, we might just open it up for a question or two. Anyone? Okay, then I'm not gonna ask a question, I'll say something. Somebody told me this, and this is not mine, but churches that are thriving these days, these are some of the variables. The number one is they risk. In other words, they're willing to risk. Um, and, they, and they take seriously the Jesus phrase, be not afraid, which is about, I'm told, like 365 times in the Bible. Uh, so churches that are willing to risk. And our church just has named, we have three core values, hospitalities, which is how we eat together, and that's a big ministry. They eat lunch together every week, every week, uh, with the exception of August. So 11 months of the year, they have lunch. Oh, they're eating, the, okay, I didn't know this. They're eating this here, too. Um, but they have food every week, and it's, and it's, and it's volunteers to put this out. And, they, and 100 people, 125 people stay every week to eat together. I don't know how churches uh, do church just with a styrofoam cup of coffee after church. It's not going to go anywhere. You have to eat together. There's a guy who told me, he said, I go to lunch because I sit with people who are not like me. And it's really true. And it's this community that, that participate from the congregation and those from the city, literally, who are, who are nowhere to live, come for lunch, with that interaction of people, so food. But anyway, that's hospitality. Spirituality is the kinds of things, programmatic things that we do uh, to deepen our spiritual life. Uh, if you think of what I was just saying about that, how do we attend to that? The third value they have is social justice, and you heard an example of that around the refugees. But the fourth value the church just named as a practice is risk. So, so we will say that's one of the things we value. And this came to us when we realized all, all the time the church has risked in the last 11 years. Risk after risk after risk. And we said, let's make that one of the things we're going to say that we do. And so there's always a push now to say, are we, are we actually living this value of risk? But anyway, churches that are thriving, think about the ones you know, do they risk? And you've heard from the edge tent here, lots of churches that have risked. I think it's amazing this afternoon, some of the stories we heard, right? The second is that, this is not nice to say, but they've cut the ties to the denomination. And what that means when they say that is that, is that they're not, it's not they literally cut the tie. Of course we need the, the tie to the United Church. We're not sitting around waiting for the United Church to tell you what to do and how to do things. They are being innovative where they are, as you heard today already some places, and doing it. And so they're not waiting for the bureaucracy of Presbytery or Conference or General Council to tell people how to do things, but inviting where the spirits alive to do the work where they are. Um, 
the, the third thing is there's a good relationship between the leadership and the congregation and the preaching and worship ministry. Doesn't mean you have to be dynamic or charismatic or, or, or brilliant, but you have to have a good relationship between the leader and the congregation. In churches that are thriving, you can sense that relationship between the leadership and the congregation. The fourth is uh, vulnerable. Churches that are willing to be vulnerable and say, we don't have all the answers, or we don't have it all figured out, or we welcome people who, have, who don't know, uh, or who are being real. And that vulnerability is, is really, really key to churches that are thriving. There's an honesty, there's a realness, there's not playing. And the fifth one, which uh, this person has told me that you can't quite say, but the leadership are fit. That is that the leadership are fit body, mind, and spirit. The churches where the leaders are taking seriously their mental health, their physical health, and their spiritual health are, are, are churches that are thriving. So, so this, uh, these variables of churches that are thriving, it's really interesting in those five things that are named. And you need to think about how does your church do when you think about those variables. Yeah, pay for what you want is one of the tips. Eh? Churches always get to the annual meeting, they're short, and they say, what are we going to cut? You might as well kill the truth. And so our church, thank you for that, because our church, each, in the last three years, it's upped its budget up by over $100,000 each year by saying, this is what we want, this is what it's going to cost, this is what it's going to mean. And now the budget's moved in, in 11 years from 120000 to just under a $1 million in, in 10 years. But it's because, just of that, if you want this, then pay for it, <coughs> right? I did have a question about your clothes and that um, wherever you are. Wherever you are, wherever you're at. How did you come up with that? How, how do we come up with our own? Okay, that's a great exercise. The whole point of this book is you, is you buy the book, 1999, <laughs> uh, and you take a chapter and read each one each week. But the story of that was, it was our 100th anniversary, and Millie Mays came into the office. She said, it's our 100th anniversary. we got to get a banner. And we said, what should it be? She said, 100th anniversary. <laughs> I said, okay, that's going to be good for that day. And so literally, we, we thought about a small group for, for a short time and came up with that phrase, whoever you are, wherever you're at, is really wide, and join us in the journey. So it came out of a small group. But I've seen banners. Uh, there's a great one in Calgary right now. It says, church for those who don't fit church. I like that, right? And in the book, I talk about this. You go down Elbow Drive in Calgary, and there's, I remember this day I was with my 16-year-old daughter. The sign for the St. Peter's Anglican Church said this. All it said was, tea and dainties, 2 p.m. And my daughter says, like, what's a dainty? Right? But imagine thousands of people going by the church, and that's all it says, right? There's nothing about what they do. And I happen to know the priest there, and they did some really great things, but they needed to rebrand re themselves. It costs you about 300 bucks, but what's the? Uh, but what a fun game to say. What's the one thing we want to say, and how do we want to have a banner? You could have five or six or eight banners over the year and recycle them through. But that statement is so clear and needs to be a non-churchy, open invitation to people. But but you but don't lie. If you put up a banner that says we're old and we're no fun and we're serious, that's great if that's who you are. But don't say, we're young and vibrant. And then everybody comes in and you're not, right? So you really, it, as long as there's integrity with what you say you are and who you are, that integrity, you could truly have a church that says, we're old farts. And it probably could do really well. <laughs> if that's who you are. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, I'm curious, what's been the biggest surprise for you in your first year? My biggest surprise? Um, that's a great question mark. Um, question mark. Um, <laughs> what surprised me most? I, you know what? It, I think it's the the intentionality that we have as a community to practice authenticity. There is um, a richness of accountability, one with another neighbor and stranger, 
folks brand new. Um, one of the ways we model that, of course, is in the liturgy that we practice on a Sunday morning. Every, every week, you're gonna come in and don't expect to sit down in that pew and just consume and take in. You are part of creating the divine drama, right? We Worship is what we create together. So at least once in the service, there'll be an opportunity for you to turn to a neighbor as you've already done this afternoon and have some conversation. And so that modeling um, of being real and being authentic, of being, of being able to say to one another, this is who I am today, this is who I am right now, um, it has been a real joy to know that it can happen, that the experiment can, can produce that kind of fruit, the experiment of what it is to be um, in Christian community. Yeah, thanks for the question. For sure. Yeah, appreciate that. So they call themselves Thrive, T H R I V E, and that's their that's their modus operandi. That's their M O. They really want to be a thriving community and thriving individuals being formed in the under the banner of Jesus. Um, they meet every Thursday between seven and nine. We meet in the treehouse of the church, which is really is the upper balcony above our heritage room. Lots of trees up there, potted plants. Um, the program runs as such. They uh, it it can it's seasonal. So, for instance, for Lent, the, the leadership team, you know, did a query out on Facebook, what does the group really want to do? And the shout back was, we want to study scripture. 25, 25-year-olds who said, we want to study the stories of the New Testament. So we laid it out for seven weeks. That's what we did. We did faith talk. And so we had Bible stories, and people knew what they were up and coming on Facebook. There were videos that went out a few days before, and they came prepared. We did everything fun, you look from charades to getting right down to people marking each other with holy oil. Um, we talked about demons. We talked about justice. We talked about um, sexuality. It, yeah, that sort of thing. So what we're rolling out this fall, the idea is possibly that this Thrive group will become the seed community um, likely for our third service. Um, to happen on one of the evenings of the week. I'm kind of debating if it's Thrive Thursday or Sunday evening. We'll see what happens. Um, and uh, another alternative worship service will likely come out of this. Yeah, so we're on a Sunday morning. You can join us at 9 o'clock or 10.45, 9.05, 10.45. Um, and we also want to talk about just a little bit. We also have a spiritual director who is part of our um, leadership team, and she runs a Wednesday morning contemplative service, Wednesday morning starting at 7 a.m., and uh, that ministry has been up and running for the past three months, and it's really taking off. Also, yeah, yeah. So you can connect with with every all of the ministries through Facebook. Yeah, Hillhurst United Church and Kids Space or Thrive Worship, whatever have you. Our website's also a really great place. A um, few things to learn from the website there. We just got it revamped. Um, one of the things we've learned about is to keep the conversation going. So to have a blog nest nested within your website is a great way to get people. Um, shouting back with responses to whether it be the sermon or something that we did in the community or a justice call out um, to that sense of mutuality, that back and forth conversation. What we model on a Sunday morning to have that on the website is also a really great thing. There was another question, or I'm sure. <laughs> Sorry, I giggle because <laughs> in 12 months I'm like, so do we have historic roles? Uh, <laughs> Uh, how many people, how many members do we actually have? It's great. On a Sunday morning, our 9.05, um, anywhere between 120 to 150. And our 10.45, usually 300 to 350, John. Yeah. So likely in our doors, most Sundays, there are a minimum of 450 people. Did I get those numbers right? Yeah, and it's yeah. a very diverse. It's very diverse, and uh, not ethnically diverse age-wise. It's uh, there's not a lot of seniors, but but it's there's a, on a Sunday. So I'll give you this to, to help you with this. So when I got there the first year I was there, there, were, there was no Sunday school, and uh, then a couple of kids showed up, and I said, "You got to pay for what you want." So we had to hire somebody ten hours a week to do the work with the kids. Now they registered last year. I know this number: two hundred and fifty-eight kids. And they have a they have 12 people who work in Sunday school, okay, maybe 13. Uh, so that all the Sunday school teachers are paid, pay for what you want. We have amazing staff, people who oversee it, and then a, a staff person who oversees the whole program. But I tell you that because again, if we had sat there and said, well, let's wait till there's eight or ten or fifteen, and then send the mother down to you know hear that story, right? 
So, so we've always had excellent people uh, leading, and there's always a rotation through, but they're all paid uh, to be there. And uh, I think $20 an hour, I think, is what they're paid. And the Sunday school is five, just five hours for the Sunday uh, for those people. And then there's people who oversee it that are paid more, obviously. But the other thing I should say about staffing is a lot of people get ministers. We're, we're, ministers are not the people to hire, uh, really, in churches. <laughs> They're really not. So, so there's an executive director, as an example, who's there, and her she's the second person just coming on staff, and she takes care of. She's going to be overseeing a lot of the finance and the staff, and the programmatic work there. Uh, the affirming person again is not a clergy person, but she's 30 hours and working uh, with in the LGBTQ community. Uh, the finance person is, uh, is she, she's a CA, but she, uh, she is there uh, 30 hours a week working with this, uh, in the finances. Um, I tell you this because um, the, the more diverse the staff is and the less clergy-centered it is, it's actually get the right people doing the right things. Ministers aren't good at lots of things, so get the people who are really good at what they're good at on your staff, and it really grows um, the conversation and the way the, work, the church works. Um, more effectively. And I would sort of add to that just to say that it extends to your governance structure also. So we've been really blessed to, to um, call call together the right people on the board. I've, that's been a great surprise, Mark, too, just to be part of a quality board experience with individuals who um, uh, are there because of their skill set, not because of their egos, and who are there because they're committed to the mission and vision of the congregation, um, not because they've always sat in that chair. And um, so to be at a board meeting is anything but boring. It's the highlight of the month for both of us in a lot of ways because we get to lean back and overhear, overhear fabulous conversation um, about what, what is active ministry? What does it look like for us as a congregation five, 10 years out? We just finished a planning for possibilities um, uh, process with the whole congregation around that. One of the most amazing surprises for me was sitting at the second or third board meeting and we, like many churches, have a daycare that rents some space in the basement, a lot of space, in the basement of our 100-year-old church. And um, the spaces that I've come from, when I sat at other board and session tables with rentals, they were always looking for ways to keep them in or to get more, right? Because it was a way of getting revenue into the space. And here I was at Hillhurst, my second or third board meeting, leaning back, and we were having vibrant conversation, they were, about the possibility of moving this daycare out because we were in need of space. And you know what wasn't there? A theology of scarcity. That we would miss the $60,000, $60, right? What was there was a theology of possibility and what might be. And the kind of spaces would open up for others and the ministry and the larger community. And uh, that, that's refreshing. And a lot of that has to do with getting the right people on the bus and the right people in the seats where there's a fit with their skills and an investment into the mission and vision of the community. So um, thank you, John Pentland. One, one, one. <laughs> do you have a pastoral care worker with you? Or? That's a good question. So, so there ha the, up to this year, OK? Um, that's part of the responsibility of Danielle's job is to oversee a, a group of people who are seven or eight people who do the congregational care. Uh, whether it's food or prayer shawls or visits or cards or things like that, but it's not a tradition, not in a traditional sense of they just do the pastoral care. It's more um, lay, lay led, I would say, um, within the congregation. Okay, here's what the book looks like: fishing tips. Um, he hates this part. Yeah, so it's 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 a fun book. Um, it, it's uh, yeah, there you go, there you go. I could do a little dance. Uh, it was fun to write, and it's really nine things that the church did, not what I did, nine things the church did to, to turn it around and how they threw the nets on the other side. And, uh, and so each chapter has got a story, like the one I told you about Lily. There's a story, then the tip, then some questions that you're meant to be in conversation with the people who are reading it. Um, and, and what would Jesus say to the particular tip? Because all of the tips, I would say, are biblically, biblically based. And so it's, uh, I, would, I would make the case that it's biblical, and it's theological, it's spiritual, and it's religious. And it's really the story of what Hillhurst did. The people there did. I got lucky 
Um, but one of the things I would want to say is if you're looking to move to a church, go somewhere small. Go tiny, and then you can grow it. It's hard to turn 150 people around. It's easy to turn 50 around. Um, and so the, the, the work that they did to help that happen. And there's lots of excellent people doing great ministry in this tent, in this event, and I give thanks for the uh, chance to say something about that work that we're doing. Thanks, John. Walk with me, I will walk with you and build the land that God has planned where love shines through. Walk with me, I will walk with you and build the land where God has planned where love shines through. I've been doing a lot of walking lately, and uh, it's been good. It's been really good. I've been checking my iPhone and my Google Maps a lot, and I like that I can trust my Google Maps. I like knowing that there are people out there in little cars, maybe using their drones, working on behalf of Google to help me navigate the new territories that I find myself in. A few weeks ago, actually, no, I take that back, a few months ago um, at Hillhurst, um, a member of Google, a paid employee of Google, came into the church and said, hey, we're navigating this terrain of Kensington in inner city Calgary, and we'd love to take some pictures of your church so that it can show up on Google Maps. Great, let's make this happen. The church is on the map. A few weeks ago, I was in France and just having a little bit of personal time. You know, you gotta do that sometimes, and I walked a lot. One day, I think I walked 25 kilometers in one day, just strolling with a girlfriend, and it was fabulous. It was there on the streets of Paris that I learned that there was actually a movement of walkers through France. I think they were called the flaneurs, and they would walk sometimes using a map of London to walk around Paris. The intention was to get lost and to find new lands and to find places and spaces that they had not been before. Some of the flaneurs I also learned would do scent walks where they would follow the smell of a boulangerie. Mm, where is that chocolate pastry? Or they would follow the smell of a sewer and see where it took them. I've been doing a lot of walking lately and using a lot of maps. And my hunch is that for the church that we are a part of, um, the global church and ecumenical community here, that many of us are not sure what maps we're supposed to be using these days. We're not sure of the terrain that we're in. Even in the terrain that might feel familiar, we're not sure how to navigate it any longer. It seems that some of the pews have moved or the rocks or the things that we thought were steady landmarks have shifted for us. So I've been thinking about sacred cartography, about holy mapping, and what that image and metaphor might open up for us as peoples who strive to be thriving right where we are with the people that God has given us to bloom where we have been planted. How do we take notice of the, of the territory that we are being invited to navigate anew? I wanna offer two things today um, in my reflection just about that. And one is deeply connected to a new burgeoning ministry um, at Hillhurst. One of my thinkings is that as we navigate this new terrain, um, as being part of thriving communities, sacred cartography, it's deeply connected and contingent upon us doing good soul work. Good soul work. John talked about good religion and at Hillhurst, we put that out there and we also go a little bit around that and drill down into that and talk about soul work. When you think about your soul, what comes to mind? When you think about your soul, what comes to mind? Connection. Groundedness, longings, longings brokenness. brokenness.
there's a way in which the territory, the neighborhood of our souls matters for the health and future viability and sustainability of who we are as the people of God. And our hunch collectively at Hillhurst is the sense in which we have for too long been paying attention to the externalities, the pulpit, the man at the front, the book in the hand, rather than paying attention to the internalities, the internal, the interior landscape, the interior territory, the interior mapping. Let's begin to take a little meditative journey, shall we? It's four o'clock in the afternoon, done a lot of head work. Maybe you'll come on a little soul walk with me now. Are you open to that? Yeah? If you're sitting on a hard bench and you feel like you can handle that, that's okay. Maybe you wanna to drop to the ground and use the back of the bench as your back support. Just get comfy. And we're gonna do a little bit of mapping, sacred mapping, just walking through our our soul landscape a little bit. Now the intention here is that you stay awake with your soul. <laughs> it's not meant to lull you into sleep. But if you daydream, that's okay. I think the soul is about daydreaming, cultivating imagination. After all, the creator God is creative. All right, right where you are. If I you take a deep breath in and release. Here we go, deep breath in and release. Trinity, third time, deep breath in and release. And continue as you will, consciously and unconsciously, breathing in and out, in and out. We remember along with our sacred ancestors, those who dared not to speak the name of God, that the sound of breath was connected to the very identity of God. Yod, He, Va, He, Yahweh. Could it be that the very name of God is the sound of our breath? And we breathe. You remember what Taylor de Chardin said, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. You are spirit breathing in and out. And that spirit within you has a location it's on the move, and yet, for each of us, somewhere in our body, there's a sense in which you know where she lives. Why don't you touch that space now? Maybe it's your chest or your heart. Maybe it's your throat or your gut. Maybe you know spirit when you touch your little toe. Right there. You are spiritual beings, and you are breathing. You are soul. You are light. Jesus said, I am the light. And that cosmic Christ presence lives and breathes and moves in you now. Visit with yourself in that soul spot. Go to that space that only you know. Meister Eckert said that the soul is that place that has never been wounded or tainted. It is your truest, most possible self. Find that place within you now. There it is. There it is. And go a little deeper into that space, and lo and behold, it is a neighborhood. 
For in that soul is the complexity of who you are, the beauty of who you are, the composite reality of all your experiences, where you have been, and there lingers to the hope of where you might go. So let's map that space into that soul neighborhood. And we begin to walk following that invitation to be our truest selves and to follow the light of love. What's there in your soul neighborhood? Who do you see? From what parts of your life are they from? Who's smiling at you? Who's reaching out to embrace you? Who has offered you a seat that you might rest? Or a cup of water that you might drink? Not only who, but what is in this neighborhood, this beautiful, dynamic soul neighborhood. Is there river or ocean? Trains bellowing? Is there some blue sky or is there sunset? Is there mountain or desert? Carolinian forest or redwoods? I wonder what sounds there are too. The ones that remind you of your truest self and your cosmic connection to God, to the divine. Do you hear church bells or birds chirping? Do you hear the sound of your children playing? Do you hear the crackling of a door opening and someone you love walking through? Enjoy your stroll through your soul neighborhood. This is you. This is you and God. This is what Pico Iyer calls the art of stillness. This is the bedrock of contemplative ministry, of knowing who you are and whose you are in this soul place. Oh, you beautiful people, spiritual beings having a human experience. Look at your radiant soul neighborhoods, so dynamic and lovely, particular, cherished. Take a deep breath in. And wait. Let's try that again. Deep breath in. And wait. And when you come back to this moment in community, know that you can touch that spot, that little toe or that heart spot at any point throughout the rest of the day and reconnect with a part of you that is always with you. Amen. Part of what I'm learning about um, being a Christian and being on this experiment of faith, this unfolding journey, is that the interior work matters. It was 1988 when my family moved to Canada, a cold December day. We left 33 degrees Celsius weather in Port of Spain of Trinidad and Tobago. And my dad put a wool sweater on me on the plane, and I broke out in hives, apparently allergic to wool, had had against my skin before in that way. And we landed at Pearson Airport, and it was minus 15 and snowing. And I squealed, oh, this is what manna looks like. <laughs> Having only seen it in the children's um, Bible books. 
And I recall um, coming into the United Church of Canada a few years later on the invitation of some young people in downtown Brampton who said, we have a fabulous uh, youth choir, and I know you like to sing. And so I came into the church, and this was uh, grade nine for me. And there, um, in those early 90s years, the messaging was all about, we are a church of mission. We are a church of justice. We do not drink bottled water. <laughs> and uh, I was imprinted with this sense of social action, and that's what it was all about. And I went off to seminary at Yale to study with Letty Russell because she was um, a leading thought uh, thinker around liberation theology, and I wanted to do my thesis with her, and I did. I had that fortunate experience before she passed a few years ago. And it was all about social action. And I worked in New Haven and uh, on behalf of the marginalized, and I was arrested several times to my mother's horror and took the bus down to Atlanta to march and protest at the School of the Americas. And it was all about social action. That's what I thought the gospel was all about. So I thought the United Church um, taught me well. And that liberation sensibility and yearning for a kingdom in which I can participate and be a part of creating continues to, to be within me. But something happened along the way in addition to that story. I actually learned something about another side of action and John mentioned it in the website that he referenced, cac.org. The other side of action is contemplation. And I remember sitting in um, Marquand Chapel, which is the seminary chapel at Yale, and for the first time in my life, um, having a visit. And I had a mystical experience, a visit with an angel. I was in discernment about what I needed to do. Did I need to come home and return to my United Church of Canada or stay in the States and work with one of the Presbyterian or UCC churches uh, that I was working with in the United States? And I had a visit, a mystical experience. And I dropped into prayer in a way that I had never dropped into prayer before. It dropped into me. And it was the kind of prayer that dove right down to that neighborhood of soul that we were all just visiting. And it was one of my first experiences, uh, real embodied experiences, of, of a spirit living inside of me with such an active stillness that I knew there was yet another dimension to my faith story that I needed to explore. Contemplation. Prayer. Now, I don't know how you pray. Um, I tend to pray in a lot of different kinds of ways. Um, but I recently came across a poem by one of the state poets of New York, and her name is Marie Howe. And I shared this, this prayer poem actually just this past Sunday with the congregation, because um, it speaks a little bit of sometimes the frustration that we can feel about dropping into that quiet space. I know so many of us are busy, maybe making time to be here this weekend is a sabbatical retreat for some of us, right? So just tell me if this resonates with you a little bit when you think about prayer. Every day I want to speak with you. And every day something more important calls for my attention. The drugstore, the beauty products, the luggage I need to buy before the trip. Even now I can hardly sit here among the falling piles of paper and clothing, the garbage trucks outside already screeching and banging. The mystics say you are as close as my own breath. Why do I flee from you? My days and nights pour through me like complaints and become a story I forgot to tell. Help me. Even as I write these words, I am planning to rise from the chair as soon as I finish this sentence. I know that sense of impatience. I know that, wrestle, that wrestling to make space and time for that art of stillness. But it's a deep part of what it is to be people on the journey, and we're discovering at Hillhurst a deep part of what it is to become a thriving community, to take seriously the mission, the striving externally, the service, and the interior work. So um, more than a year ago, I think there was a seed planted for Hillhurst United Church to create a contemplative ministry, a contemplative arts ministry. And part of the vision was to hire and have on staff a licensed paid professional, a spiritual director. 
Now, I don't know of any other United Church, United Church of Canada, that has a spiritual director, SDI certified, on their staff team. But we were really blessed with the initiative of Chasing the Spirit. Nope. Embracing the Spirit. Woo! To uh, get a seed grant in order to make this possible. Because we believe that soul work is a part of what it is to be in formation and in community as individuals and collectively. So we call it Daybreak. And Susan Cooper is our awesome spiritual director on staff. And she runs a Wednesday morning service uh, beginning at 7 o'clock. And it's an hour-long facilitated readings and meditation space um, that welcomes 25 to 35 people um, each Wednesday morning on this ministry. After the first hour, it's followed by um, oftentimes an, a contemplative arts experience. So this month, I think it's this month, July, that after that hour, they're um, experiencing Kijong with um, a practitioner of that meditative practice. And an hour after that is for conversation, debriefing, one with another, um, experiencing and talking about what they just experienced the hour or two hours before. In addition to that, the other main thrust of the Spiritual Direction Contemplative Arts Ministry is that Susan is able to give one-on-one, -on -one, you're welcome, one-on-one -on -one sessions in Spiritual Direction um, with individuals who are seeking that kind of intentional soul work, kind of intentional soul work, which is a really fabulous thing. So we just wanted to take the opportunity, John and I did, to um, say thank you to Edge for being able to um, support us in writing and creating that grant. And to get you all thinking a little bit now, um, just to take two minutes or so, again, one with another, um, it'd be interesting, I think, for you all to turn to each other and talk a little bit about how you're experiencing in the neighborhoods that you're in, your faith communities, how you're experiencing soul work showing up right where you're at. How you're experiencing soul work because you just had an experience of dropping into it. How is that showing up in the neighborhood of your faith communities right where you're at? And the follow-up question, if you get to it, is how might you nurture that in the communities where you are? Okay, so let's go for that for two minutes. How are you experiencing soul work where you're at? And how might you continue to further and nurture it? Okay, so another 30 seconds. Okay, 
just want to spend our last few minutes together then um, offering um, one more area of uh, reflection when we think about thriving communities from where I stand. Um, and it's just me risking putting it out there, um, putting myself, um, naming my social location and reality and naming some of the things that I observe as a part of this uh, family of God, and particularly the United Church of Canada. I want to talk just a little bit and get you talking a little bit about diversity in our congregations. Um, my sense is that we have done some really good marketing around uh, being a diverse and inclusive community of faith and across the, across the country, coast to coast to coast. Um, but my reality has been that that's been a little bit of a myth, us living into certain expressions of diversity. So my social location is um, as an ordained minister of the church. Um, I hold several degrees, including a doctorate, and I have a lot of privilege. I'm also a racialized woman, and those uh, particular intersections of my gender and my ethnocultural heritage um, find themselves in a marginalized, marginalized place within the United Church of Canada. So I named that a little bit boldly, maybe a little bit tentatively, but also reality. Um, I love that we are here together on this beautiful sunny weekend, um, but I'm also noticing that there are not many people who look like me. There are not many people who aren't presenting culturally, ethnoculturally white under this tent or under many of the tents that we are part of over this weekend. It's just something to name. And I really have a sense that in order for us to be a relevant, um, resurrection-focused, vital and vibrant um, neighborhood of communities across this country, we need to be part of deconstructing the mythology that we are diverse. And we need to be even more active in our pursuit of making that into a reality. There's a fabulous passage from our shared ancient story, and you know it well. It's from Acts 2. When the Holy Day of Pentecost came, 50 days after Passover, they were gathered together in one place. A sound roars from the sky without warning, the roar of a violent wind, and the whole house where you are gathered reverberates with the sound. Then a flame appears, dividing into smaller flames and spreading from one person to the next. And all the people present are filled with the Holy Spirit and begin speaking in languages they've never spoken as the Spirit empowers them. Because of the Holy Festival, there were devout Jews staying as pilgrims in Jerusalem from every nation under the sun. They hear the sound and a crowd gathers. They are amazed because each of them can hear the group speaking in their native languages, and they are shocked and amazed by this. Just a minute, they say. Aren't all of these people Galileans? How in the world do we all hear our native languages being spoken? Now, I've heard that text read and preached on, uh, read in different languages and celebrated across the United Church as a text that says we, God's, God's church is diverse, and we as the United Church of Canada are diverse. My sense with this text lately has been that it's actually a shout out, it's a call, it's a commissioning to say to us that we need to take even more seriously our diversity kingdom direction because it is the very first work of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that? We celebrate Acts 2, Pentecost Sunday, as the birthday of the church, the launching of the church, when the Holy Spirit came and descended with these flames of fire upon the church. And what was the very first thing that the Holy Spirit did? What was the very first thing that the Holy Spirit did? The very first thing she did was to empower those that were in the locked room to get out of their bubble, out of their internal looking and gazing at one another and stretch themselves in languages of difference and diversity. She actually empowered them with the very speech 
And I imagine speech to be not only of the tongue, but of embodiment, to speak languages of difference, to cross over, to engage. How is it that we hear all these Galileans speaking our own language? I really just want to do a mic drop as my closing, because um, this is, for me, this is one of the prophetic edges of who we are being called, um, called to act and embody as, as churches and communities moving forward in Canada. When we look at the face of the city that I live in, in Calgary, and likely the face of the city, even if you're in a small community, the cities that you're connected to, and it's a global network that we're all a part of, if we don't take more seriously our ethnocultural, our diversity, our difference, um, our multiple belongings, our interspirituality, if we don't take this more seriously, we don't stand a chance at continuing to be relevant in the church of the future. And I just want to encourage us to be a little bit more bold, a little bit more bold from our pulpits, a little bit more bold in our exegesis and reading of our scriptures, a little bit more bold in our conversations with our children and with our youth about this, these realities of power, of difference, of diversity, of change, and to ask the questions when the people aren't at the table, who's not here? Why aren't they here? Whose voices are we not listening to? Whose voices will we benefit from hearing? My drop? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> I wonder if anyone has a comment um, from, or an experience from their particular location that they think would speak into some of this. Is what I'm saying resonating? Is it something that you're seeing in your neighborhoods? Is it something that you challenge your own boards and leadership or yourself? to be more attuned to and in tune with? How is this connecting with us? All right, Mike Cher. Here we go. Yeah, come on. Um, Paul from London. So we've been very intentional about diversity. Yeah. What we've discovered is the one thing that we can do is move from a classist church. Mm. So we're now seeing all the different um, uh, people are like the poor have never felt welcome in United Churches, right? Historically, they didn't have the clothes, the, the, the lower classes don't have our manners, blah, blah, blah. So at Trinity, we now have the diversity of, I'd say probably a third of our congregation are on Ontario, uh, ODSP, uh, welfare, different kinds, right? So that's been significant. The frustration, we've also got diversity in that we who are Christians claim Jesus, but we're clear to the community that our core value is love, and we don't care if you're an atheist or a Buddhist or whatever. And so there's, a, I'd say 20% of the people coming to worship regularly don't self-identify as Christians. So we're getting that diversity. We're having real difficulty uh, reaching out to other ethnic communities. We had an amazing... Uh, uh, African Canadian woman uh, in leadership, and and you know I thought we'd be able to reach into that community, but our stand with the gay community is costing us our relationships with the black community and with the gypsy community. We made inroads. I didn't even know there were gypsy communities, and I discovered you know a whole community in London, and they started to come. But when they saw that we were affirming, you know, homosexuality as an expression of, of God's uh, diversity and, and intention for the world, um, they just dropped us. And 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 all, you know, Charmaine's friends that went to church, right? The black community in London is very anti-homosexual. So I guess you got to take diversity where you can find it. Um, you know, we are getting people of the rainbow community as a part of our church, and we're getting the different class groups, and, you know, and, and that kind of diversity. But we're having the eth other ethnic based groups we're really having trouble with, and it's primarily the gay issue that we're finding is the division. Interesting. I appreciate your comments, Paul. Um, definitely uh, like where you opened with the sense of opening up uh, class 
socioeconomic class within the community. Um, two things to say just about your other comments. Um, one is, I think theologically for me, there's a sense in which there is lots of room at, at God's table. Um, and so, so the, the diversity of where we stand on a variety of different issues um, I'd like to think, as we continue to move forward with a big tent metaphor of who we are, that there is room for the conversation, and that there's room for the practices and spiritual practices of conversation as we continue together to discern and act in a way that, that moves us as beloved community, as Dr. King liked to talk about. Um, there's a real danger, my sense and personal experience here, when we talk about us and them, and, and we begin to make assumptions about the homogenization of they, like, they, the black community, are a little bit more theologically conservative, for instance. Um, it's, a real, it's a real sociological conundrum and fascination to me that we can often look at the, the tribe that we are a part of and say, wow, there's so much diversity. My friends are all so different. They all think differently. Oh, we all dress differently. From the outside, though, you can look like one, like one mob. Right, and so on the inside we can say, oh, we're so we're so complex and complexified and, and variegated and different, and then there's a they, and all those folks that look the same, dress the same, speak the same tongue, or you think are in a theological position have to be the same. That's one of the things when I'm talking about this work around diversity that thanks for raising it, Paul, um, would be part of active, actively, constructively deconstructing those kinds of assumptions. And so we would we would work even we would work more intentionally on the uniqueness of each person, each story, each individual, as much as we are able, and to make that possible. When we begin to group um, group one another and speak of groups of peoples, I don't have to I, I don't have to give you a history lesson here on how dangerous that can be. Thanks for your comments, Paul. Thanks for opening the conversation. Rob wants to say something. Um, so the last few months have been so difficult for Canada yeah. and, and the United States, but Canada we're here. And I'm, I'm kind of grateful for the conversations just starting about the inherent racism in Canadian society. And it is so difficult for dominant cultures to really see and then see, and see, and see. And it can't happen without that conversation. And as difficult as that as it has been for some, and as defensive as it sometimes makes people, it is, it is a huge relief to me to hear it become part of the, the um, societal conversation. And deep gratitude to the Black Lives Matter movement to actually really provocatively put that conversation on on the agenda. And it still amazes me. Yeah, I mean, there's still so much to do. Um, but there's a great opportunity here. I mean, that's the other side of it, right? It, when, when we recognize um, that kind of deformation of human relationships, there is an opportunity for healing. And it continues to amaze me. I mean, as, a, as one who grew up in the very center of the dominant culture in Canadian society, uh, and as, you know, largely through my experience in the United Church of Canada, the scales come off, and you, it's a little fuzzy, and then it gets clearer. And, and that's, you know, that's, uh, it's a difficult journey, and it's a hopeful journey. But I'm then amazed to hear like Mark McDonald this morning talk about his hopefulness for Canada. After, you know, as I get clearer and clearer on what we did, and he begins to speak of hope for Canada. And that, that has been a great gift to me. And also, similarly, the Black Lives uh, Matter movement to, to lift these things up and help us to actually deal with them. And then there's hope. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for sharing. Maybe there's one more comment from the tent. Welcome. Hi, um, I'm Duncan. I'm from Toronto. Hey, Duncan. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so I'm currently on the path going through the whole paperwork and everything uh, in order to become a minister for the United Church. Yeah. Um, but I remember uh, talking with the minister at my church and uh, some of the people, and one thing that really stuck out with me was being told that I would have no issue in going through the process because the United Church wants to diversify their ministry, and I could be a token. Yeah. They never used the word token, but, you know, it was very much implied. And one thing I, I very, I, I, I really enjoy at my church, the uh, the coffee time afterwards, uh, being able to socialize, talk about things, whatnot, uh, learn about people. But one thing I very much dislike is always, uh, basically, Ask, where are you from? <laughs> I'm from Brampton. <laughs> 905. 905, yeah, right there. Brampton General. Right All right, most of my family is uh, either white or indigenous. Um, some of my family is from the Caribbean. But people always insist, like, where are you from? And what's worse than that is, where are you really from? Yeah. Where's your family from? And I think. What we need to do as an intentional community uh, for diversification is to no longer put so much of an intention on the differences that we have. The one thing we all, um, what makes us unique is that we are somewhat the same and the one thing we have that is the same is that we are all unique. And I think putting a label on each person saying, oh, they're this, so that's great that we have this in our community, uh, is really where we're coming up with that issue. I see so often uh, communities with, you know, I hate to put one group on the spot, but the little old church ladies, you know, uh, coming up to new uh, members and basically being, oh, where are you from? Oh, where's your family from? When do you move to Canada? All that stuff. Um, and I think putting less of a uh, focus on the differences that we have based purely on the color of our skin or whatnot is where our issue is coming from. And I think we just need to forget about those labels and forget about putting such an effort into diversifying our communities and just let our communities thrive. Thanks for your comments, Thanks for your comments I do think there's a sense um, in which Duncan's onto something there that God is indeed up to something, and there's uh, a pos there is there are always possibilities for for thriving just on the horizon. There is also great work to be done in our intentionality in paying attention to what the realities are and working for justice, working for equity, um, working to celebrate our stories, working intentionally to welcome others. Um, and so I hope that we'll put our feet to the ground. We'll stay in touch with our souls. We'll keep our imaginations open. That we'll hold hands with one another. And that we'll walk together, following that sweet fragrance of love as God's people. Diverse, different, and all together beautiful. Thanks for your time, friends. Um, so this was kind of a double presentation together. Thanks for that. I didn't have to do thank you. So, but I want to thank John. When I when he started, I said, "You'll remember what he said," and it was great for me to see the first use of the uh, embracing the spirit notepad <laughs> to take notes on the seven hours of, of religion. It was great, and uh, it is so good, uh, Danielle, to see those ours lived out in your engagement with us post uh, in terms of both the ritual and the reality things got very real and uh, and I thank you for that and um, please join me in uh, expressing your gratitude as well